Inshallah and Ashe. Blessings to you, my energetic beings. And as always, welcome back to Musing with Tanya D podcast. I am your host. My name is Tanya D. I am a practicing holistic shaman, medium, an otherworldly life coach, and a subtle energetic surgeon, a reflector by human design. And yes, I've known I'm a reflector for quite some time since before. I actually started my podcast. Either way, my intention truly is, is to utilize the power of indigenous technologies, wisdom, ancient wisdom of our bones down to our original divine blueprint to really navigate through our soul's harmonic, the realm of the elementals, the elemental highway into and through the imaginal realm, the shaman's portal. And welcome to the season of that, by the way, Scorpio. Really reintroducing you to the magical being that I truly believe heartfelt resides within each and every one of us. This energy blueprint is unique and individual, and I would call it our divine blueprint, really, to really raise our frequency to our prime directive, your inner genius. I do call myself a holistic Shaw medium, which is just a choreography of each and everything, and welcome to my podcast, Medicine Room. And I do go live on YouTube at Tanya D for a daily weekly snippet if that makes sense I used to go live daily but now I'm on the weekly I generally talk about the element of the week I believe that's our foundation I do a moon or two meditations about the moon as a reflector and ritual I've now added a ritual to my medicine room episode for meditations I share the element of the day that generally comes from the four pillars, but also the Dagara cosmology and technology. I believe the elemental realm is part of our foundation. That's why I created the rising of the origins. And that's a gateway into the realm of our own personal elemental highway. Now, a lot of curious minds are wondering why that's so very important. Just even a small understanding of your elemental foundation. That's when you can really utilize the elementals for healing, manifesting, and so much more. And when your elemental foundation is balanced and in alignment with your gift and just living your purpose, your prime directive, that's where everything starts choreographing a new energetic frequency for us and through us. And it really activates the spirit that resides within each and every one of us. We've got to bring spirit into the body to be embodied. Our spirit needs to be physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and so much more merged with um, our body climbing into our skin. But I also share insights with the subtle energies, the bodies, the fields, insights, and a lot more. And how many of you have been inspired by the season of the witches loving the interviews so far this year? Are you inspired and loving the season of the witches? That is actually why it's called Musing with Tanya D. A bit long, I suppose, but back for a return interview. This week we have for round two, Amber Tark from the Imaginal Realm. Tune into episode 716 if you want to know a little bit more about Amber. But as always, that's why it is called Musing with Tanya D. And as we cascade and flow into the final hour of the season of the witches, as we're coming to a close, sort of, to 2023, We're kind of at the last quadrant, I suppose. We're going to hear possibly from some former guests for round two. And of course, some new ones as well. But my intention truly is to really merge and choreograph the ancient wisdom, the indigenous technologies, our subtle realms, the etheric highway, to really assist each and every one of us into navigating our soul's directive, the prime directive, our inner genius, really awakening and reintroducing you to remembering who you are and the magical being that resides within each and every one of us through gift and purpose. But Amber is a depth psychologist. She is truly making her way to California. So definitely transformation is in the air. Welcome back, Amber. How have you been on the imaginal realm? I have been great. Imaginal realm has been really, really fertile for me. So I've really been doing great there. Into the imaginal, it sounds like you've watered your authenticity since we last spoke. You can say that. I I guess like once you are on this journey of trying to live what's more true for you, it keeps on growing. And like all other growth, it's also two steps forward and one step back. 
all the time and sometimes more steps back. But I guess all in all, overall, I guess the time moves on, you do get to know yourself more and more and have more and more courage to be yourself. Absolutely. So since our last gathering, I want to say what has been happening for you and to you this year? So since our last gathering, I think what has really been going on, like nothing too exciting on the outside, honestly, like it's in my outer world. But most of the things have been happening in the inner world, like a lot of work has been going on, I believe in the depth. So thinking about a lot of things, changing perspectives about a lot of things, seeing things from different perspectives, a lot of thinking going on. And I guess that's it for now. So do you want to give us some insight into, I think you were wanting to have a gathering about grief. Yeah. The the world is in such a situation and it has been for a while, you know, like we've always heard of wars and everything. I think there's a lot of collective grief. I personally know people who would suddenly wake up and say like, I don't know what's really wrong with me, but I really just feel dragged down or like I feel down. And I always tell them that apart from whatever is going on in our personal lives, I think we always have to keep in sight what's what's going on collectively. And it does affect us. It does affect us. So yeah, we're definitely in the, uh, go ahead. Whatever is in the air, it affects our energies as well. We absorb it and there is a lot of grief. And I don't think that in Western culture or in all modern cultures, honestly, like I was raised and born in Pakistan and People who have moved to urban areas, I think we we all suffer from the same thing that we do not have the communities and the rituals around grief. Like we just don't know what to do with grief. Last year, floods really hit bad most areas of Pakistan, and people were just devastated and they didn't really know what to do with it. And it's just heartbreaking to see. So I think it's an important thing to really be in touch with your grief. And then you know, like with this proliferation of positive psychology and spirituality and new agey stuff. We all think that we have somehow failed ourselves if we have not yet learned how to be happy and how to be upbeat all the time and how to keep our vibrations high. And so in the process, I think what we seem to neglect or we really try to sort of, honestly, to me, I think it's a form of denial. What we really neglect is that what is really what's bringing us down. And when those energies make their claim on us what to do with it, what to do with it with it healthily. So I think that's been on my mind. I, I've, I've myself been through difficult times too. And I think that I've learned how to be helpless, how to be sad, how to be helpless. Helplessness is a huge theme for me. And it's been showing up again and again, even, even in the people that I talk to in the conversations, it has been brought up helplessness. We, we None of us want to feel helpless. And then we make these false claims and, you know, like sort of, I don't know if I would call it toxic positivity, but we just say things and, you know, we learn how to be in the great state and we can all raise our vibration and I can get into like, say a few things of gratitude, which is all great practice, by the way, I have nothing against it, but how do we honor when something difficult and horrific shows up in our life, in our inner life or outer life? How do we honor that? I think it's a huge skill that needs to be learned too. Absolutely. And even just in the elements, you know, fire is part of the other world, our ancestors, our connection to spirit, dreams Mm -hmm. and visions. And with all the fires, you know, Maui fires, not just Maui, good Lord, that little city. Sorry, I just forgot the name. I don't know. I just thought of Maui. But either way, when fire rages out of control, it's like we've lost our connection to our spirit. It's like we're not embodying our spirit. We're more embodying the physicality of the world. So it rages out of control. And that's part of war is not being, you know, spirit has a voice. And when people aren't connected yeah. to their own spirit, living the life of what outside others Mm -hmm. may perceive spirit to be, which is fine. I mean, we all have our opinion and what we believe, and that's fantastic. But to me, it's like, uh uh-oh, we're not connected to spirit. There's some adversity in the other world trying to speak to us through the fires. 
in our connection and grief. Even my son, actually, he said when somebody had died a few months ago, say, and he said, you know, we don't get taught how to grieve. We just hurry up and get it over with. And yeah, that, you know, and get on the back on the hamster wheel. And instead of giving time and space to the person transitioning, that's why I think death doulas are actually necessary mm -hmm. for the whole process. Having somebody give you guidance, I guess is what I'm saying. But yeah, we just rush the process and right. there's no rush. We all right. grieve differently, whether yeah. it's a job loss, a house loss, whatever. It doesn't really a relationship matter. loss, uh, you know, any, any, anything. Yeah. I think we look down on it. I think that's what it is that we really think that it, it's an inferior feeling, you know, like we, we, you know, like it's very common for feelings and emotions to be labeled positive and negative. And, you know, like recently people do try to stay away from these words, but even then we look down on them. We think that there is something fundamentally wrong with feeling down or feeling sad. And if you haven't learned how to not be sad, then somehow you have failed as a modern human being. I wonder sometimes, like, how did we get away from those yeah sensation like where, what right. how did we lose this and then what where 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 did we get off our path yeah I think part of it is like with the um with the personal growth industry growing there is definitely you know people who are addicted to their pain there are those people who are constantly resentful and they cling too hard to their grievances just because they want to continue to hate and they want to continue to stay angry there's definitely that part. So, you know, a training for like how to let go of the past things that have really passed long ago is one thing. But then, you know, starting to deny whatever hard or difficult is showing up in your life right now and is making its claim on you. Because if you won't listen to it, it would show up as disease. It would show up as worse. Absolutely. Either Right. So your body will tell you if, you know, like it'll it come in your body. If you won't attend to it consciously, then unconsciously it will come on to you however way. Oh, 100%. I totally agree. The body, I think a lot of people don't really listen to their body and the language of their body. And it's reflecting on the skin. Usually what's going on inside our body is very reflective. And it's about really listening to that inner voice of wisdom that really we carry in our bones. Right. And the purpose of that, like I have, I've done in the beginning of my journey, you know, you would think that, oh, if you can attend to what's really negative or what's really difficult going on in your like if you can decode that why is your body acting up the way it is acting up maybe it would lead you to cure and maybe sometimes it would you know like you would hear all these stories sometimes that somebody diagnosed with stage four cancer and then they figured out that they didn't want to be in this relationship or they they never wanted to do this job and they just left it and they're like okay you know what whatever time i've left i'm gonna live my life i give a damn about whatever else anybody thinks because you know your time is so short that there comes a time where you, and then suddenly we know like without any treatment, oh, their cancer disappeared. So we do hear those stories and they occur too, but that's not the majority of cases. And to know about it does not necessarily mean, or the purpose of it is not to know the cure, but I think it would still in your, in the short time that you've left, if you're really diagnosed with a terminal disease, if you can listen to what it's trying to say, it would still add a lot of complexity and meaning to your life. You certainly would feel more at peace with yourself if you would really not rush through it or dismiss it or just go on to like fix it externally. If you really become in alignment with what was really trying to get to you, I still think that you will die way more peacefully. The purpose of oh, everything absolutely. is not cure, you know, like, it, and it doesn't happen. Like we don't have a control over it. Yeah. I mean, I sense too, you know, we're really not on the earth plane very long and it is the cycle of life. It's the seasons of life. No one gets out of here alive. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, you know, we return back to the realm we came from. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Definitely. So you're mentioning about successful people, the illusion of that. Do you want to dive into that a little bit? Yeah. I've been thinking about that. That has been an idea on my mind, like for a podcast at some point, that how are successful people trapped in, in their success and how the very things that empower us, how the image of that, how being perceived as being successful and being empowered can become its own cage. 
that now that we are seen as empowered, we don't want to admit in the, pla the places we are not empowered, you know? So like if I am like, especially back in Pakistan, like if I'm a financially independent woman and people see me as empowered, I would absolutely not want to admit to myself, let alone to anybody else, that in what places I am disempowered. And particularly because I don't want to hurt this image of being seen as empowered. And so whenever you have a need to be seen a certain way, you're not empowered. You are chained to that need. Now you are serving that need in some way. So I think part of the work is to become separate from like, how am I being perceived as and, and, and really ask yourself every day or however frequently you think it's necessary that what is really true for me right now? What is it that I need? And I may not be able to get it. That's just how life is. We don't always get what we want. But do I have the courage to say it? Do I have the courage to want it, to long for it and admit it that I do long for it? And to some people that would be like admitting that I desire for something that is beyond my control and I can't get it. And that sort of damages their image. And therefore, they would never admit to that. But in other ways, too, if you have a very high paying job, if you have apparently healthy, happy marriage, and you know in your bones that there's not some, something not right, and it does not have to be abuse, it's sometimes, you know, the soul leaves the marriage, just like the soul leaves the body, like at the time for the relationship is over. And it's not necessarily this one thing or that thing, or it's not something that you can analyze easily that what really happened. But you know that, you know, like your heart is not in it anymore. And just this, the image of that being successful becomes an obstruction in you saying it out loud or leaving it eventually. Because you don't want to be seen as ungrateful. That's one. But you also, you don't want to be seen as that stupid person who left a wonderful thing. I think there's a lot of things that are, I call it under the sheets. Yeah. We sometimes need to scrub what we're hiding so it can be seen because we're in a phase of transformation and growth, like you said, growing periods. And usually sometimes I find what's curious is when you're in a growth period, it might trigger somebody else to actually mm -hmm. be in a growth period because they're seeing you doing whatever you're doing. And then it, it's almost like they're getting nudged that, that they need to grow in whatever aspect that is, you know whether it's growing in um, eating better nutrition or growing in exercise or mm -hmm. reading, or, I mean, there's a variety of things that we can grow can, through or experience. Yeah. It's yeah. all individual for yeah. the person. But sometimes I think when one person changes, especially like in a marriage, the other person resists the fact that they're changing. Yes. It alters their worldview. It questions their, it makes their certainty uncertain, you know, like, so whatever they knew about this person, about this marriage is suddenly now crumbling. You don't know who this person is anymore. And so you would resist it. You would resist it by all your might. And I think it's not their fault per se. It's what we all do, you know, when we are in anxiety that we put up whatever we can to make sure that things stay the same way that they have been, even if they have been painful. <laughs> that's what we do unconsciously. So, you know, like I, I don't necessarily blame them for doing that, but that's how most people would react. And I think being in growth is you, you touched a really great point. I think part of the discomforts of especially a marriage has a lot to do with the growth and growth is not a smooth or a painless process. It involves a lot of death too. So for something new to emerge, some old needs to die. And so, you know, in the language of alchemy, the putrefication and the blackening phase of things is considered actually the negredo or the blackening of the material or the work is really considered a growth or like a, a progress because it needs to happen before something new can, like the, the old stuff needs to die down. It needs to break down. And sometimes I guess that's where where the tolerance of grief and difficulty comes in, that you can't even grow very well if you can tolerate that, that that's part of growth. You do need to learn how to die appropriately too and what needs to die and create, create space for it and create tolerance for it. A lot of us do not have tolerance for that. Yeah, especially in growth periods, even like, you know, 
your house carries a spirit in it and just mm -hmm. cleaning like out a drawer makes room for new growth and opportunity energetically, right? Uh, Depending on whatever area of your home. So I see that. And I, I find it curious. You just hit something fantastic. I have what I call a mean sister. Her heart <laughs> is whatever. Mm -hmm. But one of my other sisters who wasn't even born at the time that I had my near-death experience, she recently has kind of returned. And she'd actually brought up that my mean sister is she's just still angry that I lived. Oh she my. blames me for all these things that have happened in our family. And I, mm -hmm. and the fact that she told my younger sister that wasn't even in the world when this happened, I literally looked at my arm and I was like, that was 50 years ago. She's still hanging on to that. You know what I mean? So it's like, wow, you're still mad about that. I lived <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And, that's and you know, you, you didn't, you didn't even know about it. So who is she really hurting by, oh, absolutely. by holding on to that? Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's a huge point of, you know, it's not just to shame people. It's also like to have compassion for them. Again, you know, they, they don't necessarily know what they're doing and they don't really know that they are prisoners to their own stories like that. But whoever is hating on or being mean or being jealous or whatever, who are they hurting first and foremost? And, you know, why are they hurting? Like Why what, are they hurting? Yeah. What's yeah. inside of them? Yeah. And what's underneath this? You know, like there's always a longing underneath all these things, always a longing for yourself. And again, you know, we really specifically in Western culture, we do not have the tolerance of talking about wants or desires. Like we, we can talk all day about what we need. But we do not want to talk about desires and wants again. And I mean, talking about them does not really necessarily mean that they can be fulfilled or they will be fulfilled. But it's a huge step. Even the manifestation stuff, I truly believe that even when you start vibrating with the longing that you hold within you, when you make it conscious. And that's the other thing that I was talking about, like how when you're in love, like you constantly in fantasy and you're fantasizing about being with this person and doing this together and when you are in that kind of mind frame and in, in, in that kind of fantasy, you're really vibrating with the same, yeah, at the same frequency that the longing is to have this meaningful relationship. The longing is to have this relationship where somebody can understand you like that, or you can have fun with somebody or somebody would cherish you like that. And what you don't realize is that when you are in fantasy, you're actually vibrating at that frequency. And that's how you manifest it, really. But that's really not my subject, manifestation. What really I am interested in, that it's another thing that whether or when it will manifest or if it will manifest. But let yourself be, at least accept that it's there, that you have the desire. Oh, absolutely. And you're adding feeling to it. Right, right. And the more you fantasize about stuff, like I really think that, and I read James Hillman a lot and I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan so what he really talks about love that, you know, like we would crack our minds thinking like millions of ways and reasons why we fell in love with this person. I mean, nothing that we would ever come up with actually satisfy it. And he says like, psyche has to have a reason too. Like, you know, like it's not just plain obsession or compulsion thing. He thinks that, you know, why psyche makes us fall into love is really because it wants to initiate us into imagination. Like what it does for the imagination, like when you are in love, like how much each of us imagine and are in the imaginal, that's really something fantastic. That's a function of love that we don't tend to address or like stress a lot about. And so I just had a, it's also the love we have for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Which, you know what I mean? When you are so in love with who you are, you tend yeah. to attract that love to you. Yeah. Somebody else who's like your equal when, you know, yeah. vibrationally, whatever, you know, right. word you mm -hmm. want to use, but mm -hmm. that's what was like, you're really loving your little inner child beyond like. Right. And so you cannot love your inner child without imagination. Like there is no way whenever you love your inner child, the child is right there in front of you. It comes on and it sits in your lap, you know, like you're, you're holding your newborn self, like. There is no love without imagination. Like I think one of the biggest functions of love is to initiate you into imagination. Absolutely. I yeah. love that. I yeah. call that the shaman's portal. And also, and also, you know, like love, because, you know, love is a feeling with which opens your heart so well. 
that to be in touch with this other realm, I, I think you do need to be in that kind of state. And love is a really great catalyst for that, that it really just snaps you into that state where you are open and you're not holding on to things that would really typically interrupt your connection with this other realm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like re-gifting. Like I've been re-gifting a lot of things. They've done serving me and gifting them to others that are in need of whatever it could be. Like for instance, I had a little mini studio I worked out of and I won't go into the whys or whatever's, but I had these huge cabinets and I drove to Wyoming with my little boyfriend, Diddy here. He's in his little container now, but we went on a little traveling trip and I went, stopped and had breakfast in this little old cafe, super cute. Anyway, I gifted the guy there, my entire cabinet system, because mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to see it in, you know, the graveyard of the dump. I, I was like, who can I re-gift this to? Right. So stuff like that. I think that's fantastic. Like if it's not serving me, I'm sure it could serve somebody else and live out its purpose further. Right. When you were talking, you know, about the grief, you know, often it's in the ghost in the darkness, what I call, and but there's that piece of light there. So when you let go of the old, the ghost mm -hmm. in the darkness opens up. It's kind of like the yin and the yang. Yeah. The opposing forces. Yeah. Yeah. But I also feel like, you know, we tend to go there too fast. We think that, you know, like getting to the end of the tunnel is the goal of it. And it's not necessarily, you know, like when you are in the tunnel, just feel how it feels to be in the tunnel. Right? Yeah. Just, yeah. just be in the tunnel at the time. And, you know, like for myself and, you know, we can talk about it all day and preach to other people. But when it comes to our own lives, we still do the same things. <laughs> and so in my own life, you know, when I'm dealing with something difficult, I have to remind myself, you know, like I would find myself in resistance the first few hours or even days. And suddenly it would occur to me that what I'm really resisting right now or what I'm really feeling that I don't want to feel this way. This is really what my inner line is right now that I don't want to feel this way. So I want to quickly overcome it and feel something differently. And why not? Like what's wrong with feeling this way? Just feel this way. And sometimes, you know, there are things that you get used to. Okay, you know, like I'm 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 comfortable feeling sad now. But sometimes what you're feeling is just being empty. You know, like when you get used to have this juicy feelings of joy and love and those kind of feelings, whenever you're feeling empty and your imagination has dried out, like I really panic at, at, at that at state that, you know, like I want those juices flowing again. I don't want to feel this dry. And the more you resist it, that, you know, like you're now you're trying different things. Okay, let me meditate with this thing and let me go with, do with this guided meditation and let me read this thing and, you know, like to get the juices flow again. And all that I'm trying to do is not feel the way that I am feeling. So then I would have to consciously remind myself that there's nothing wrong in feeling the way I am feeling. Let it be. And the more you can, you know, let go of that resistance, the more easily you snap out of it too. That's yeah, like the added bonus thing that once I let go of the need to feel another way, it becomes easier. And also that phase gets over quickly. But when I, whenever you talk to somebody else or for to yourself, it just feels hard to just be in the state that you are being in. Well, like sometimes I, I reflect on, okay, what's the message here? Yeah. Like what part of me yeah. is resisting and, you know, whether it's love or hate either way, like, is this, and then I'm always asking, is this me or is this them? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, is this what's happening here? I just feel that them is also me. So, you know, like this is, this is all, this is multi, multicast of my, my inner self. Like, you know, like it, there are so many characters within me. So, you know, I have different images for different, like what they, qualities that they embody. And like, so I'm like, you know, like, it's not like, why am I feeling this way? But really the question is that maybe who is feeling this way? Like who in me wants to feel this way right now? Who in me wants to, and with the message to, you know, I've learned it from uh, Stephen Eisenstadt that uh, this is this question of who is visiting now. So whenever you I, you're, you're, you're struck with something sudden or something that is unexplained, like why did it, this mood come on me now suddenly? You know, like why, I, why did I wake up in this kind of, and I always question it or frame it the way who is visiting now. And 
when you ask a question, the psyche automatically puts something like it works its magic and you're suddenly placed somewhere whenever you ask like where am I you know like you want to ask like where am I in my journey where am I in my life where am I in my head or whatever but when you ask the question where the psyche puts you in a location and when you ask who is visiting now it gives you a person so it's pretty amazing no I, lo I love that I was just yeah. kind of asking myself what I do it's, <laughs> it's kind of like that receiving signs you know yeah you yeah know, but it's like asking. even I I love it you know like because all the time it's the ego that's driving so you know you, you you know like consciously like you you try it for this or you make this happen but I like the magic too when it happens you know outside of your awareness so specifically the things that you have no control over the dreams the moods the feelings that you don't like feeling that you're not you're not necessarily manufacturing or engineering and it's making its claim on you anyway you ask it what, what what is this now you know like who is visiting now and then whoever is visiting would let you know their purpose then it gives you an opportunity to work with it and so you know like it's a window to unconscious really yeah definitely i like yeah. that i usually wake up and say who am i going to be today <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, which one? Which one of me? You know, like there's yeah. so many of me. <laughs> who, who am I going to be today? Yeah. So is there any other fantastic idea or words you want to invoke to my listeners today? My audience? I think we've talked enough about things that I wanted to talk about. I would end with the same thing that, you know, just make the space for grief. We did touch upon that how we do not make space for it, but we really didn't say like, how to make space for it. And I think the first step, the one that we can all work on is accept the feeling. You know, you're feeling this way. There's nothing wrong with it. And there is no reason to bypass it and quickly move on to something else. Just have compassion for whoever is visiting, you know, and for yourself for having that experience and open space for it and let it be there and listen to it. And if it wants to make you cry, cry and do it in community, create rituals around it. I was just going to say, I, yeah. and we all grieve differently and yeah. one way is not better than another. We're all unique and individual. Yeah. And some people avoid grief and get back on the wheel yeah. and other people recognize they need the time and the space to allow and to surrender. And like you yeah. just said, give it time. Right. Nothing that we lose in life. I don't think that we ever completely grieve. Like, you know, like, okay, you know, now I have grieved, now I'm over it, and it's never going to touch me again. It would come in waves again and again and again. And whenever it wants to come, let it come. Allow, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's yeah. Allowing and just experience too. Experience, yeah, experience it, right? Definitely. It sometimes feels like you're in the swampland or in the mud and stuck. And sometimes it feels like to be in hell, honestly. But whatever it feels experience it experience it don't try to clean your hands too fast and you know get out of get out of it definitely and i think yeah. what you just it will enhance your capacity to feel joy too you can't feel joy when you're holding when you're when you've not grieved what needs to be grieved yeah for def i definitely agree yeah witness be a witness yeah. to your yeah. own grief yeah i mean i probably cry every day and sometimes more than once. So it's amazing like how the grief and joy can really coexist. But, you know, like in one moment, you 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 really feel down. And then, you know, like if your child smiles or does something great or you encounter something, you also have the capacity to actually enjoy it. And if you do not grieve and you do you hold on to that that stuff or you or you resist it, then so much of your energy is being spent on trying to resist it that you really can't experience the joy in just living that's also happening every day despite of whatever bad goes on in the world we wake up and we see the sun and the and then the beautiful sky and the beautiful breeze and the colors of the flowers and the chirping of the birds that's all enjoyable things and it will just go past you if you are so busy spending all of your energy in not to try to feel something difficult. Have you had a lot of people not exist with their grief this year? Specifically ask people this question, but there are a lot of people around me who do not want to 
I, I guess the fear is that if we go there, we'll just get lost and would not be able to come back. I think that's what stops people from actually going there or allowing it to happen. Yeah, I, I actually, the first time I met with Maladoma, we actually did grief ritual. Okay. And we always had community. Somebody follow you into, I'll call it the coven, the area. You never went there alone. Somebody always had your back and you weren't left in the grief. Mm. So you didn't grieve so much that you went into the other world. Like you, exactly. It's just giving time and space. And this was a great process. I recently started doing YouTube videos about ritual for each moon. And we're kind of in the season of the fall and the grief and the letting go and the, you know, heading into the harvest and our inner world a little more, more yin as we move in to the season that mm -hmm. we're in. So, yeah. And I grief often. We actually, we don't really value the possibilities in grief. Yeah. And how it brings people together too. That's another value that we overlook. Absolutely. How it can be, but like collective traumas, how they bring people together, we totally overlook the value of it. Absolutely. Well, it has been a treasure once again, Amber. I'm so grateful to have you on my Musing with Tanya D, Season of the Witches 2023. Thank you for me. Yeah, I'm grateful for you. Absolutely. Ashe, blessings. I'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. If your heart so desires to connect with Amber Tark, I will have her information in the theater notes below in the audio medicine room. And also, if you're feeling inspired, will you please take a screenshot of you listening on your device to this episode and post it on your Instagram stories tagging at the Tanya D. And for further information, please subscribe to Spill the Tea. This is a once a month live audio production I do to do just that. Spill the Tea, all things mystical and magical. Be sure to subscribe on my website, tanyad.tv. And I will see you on the other side. Ashe, blessings. Mm -hmm.